Devil May Cry is boring. Yeah, super boring. I said it. But before you get riled up, let me explain. I really can explain, I promise. A long time ago, I played the original Devil May Cry. It was not special, not good to me. And throughout the rest of the games, I didn't really touch two. I didn't enjoy four, but I loved Nero. Three was cool, and I barely played five. I didn't get far in five at all. So my image of the series is all over the place. I don't remember much. I don't remember enjoying much. And the points that I remember enjoying are like three things. So we're going to give it another shot. I'm going to completely review Devil May Cry, every single mainline game, including the reboot. Will I still think it's super boring by the end, or will I look at Devil May Cry with a brand new point of view? I guess we gotta see. So with that, it's really time. It's time to sit back. I, I ordered myself a pizza as Dante would, and I load it up. Devil May Cry bursted onto shelves in 2001 with amazing reviews. It was fresh, super cool, something completely new to the gaming scene. But it didn't start as Devil May Cry. It was originally meant to be something completely different. Something that became beloved on its own. Resident, Resident Evil 4. 4. Tasked with the creation of Resident Evil 4, Hideki Kamiya created Tony a person with supernatural powers that was originally meant to be linked to Albert Wesker in some way. You know, the Ouroboros guy. <laughs> this Tony eventually became our beloved Dante, and the game slowly shifted just like Tony. Hideki focused extensively on the combat, fusing it with elements of his personality and what he enjoyed. It slowly molded its way into something resembling what we know as Devil May Cry. Capcom did see this and didn't really think it fit Resident Evil though. But instead of completely scrapping the project, it was greenlit to become its own thing, its own title. And with the strong marketing it received and Dante's standout personality, Devil May Cry arrived smoothly in 2001. In Devil May Cry, our main character, Dante, is the son of Sparta, a demon lord who had two children with a human woman. Dante is the only one of his family left, and now he runs a rundown business called Devil May Cry. And we open to a woman who approaches Dante's building. The way I figure it, in this business a lot of you going kind of to land. And if I kill each one that comes, eventually I should hit the jackpot sooner or later. In that case... You should be used to this sort of thing. Time to go to work, guys. And she tells him that Mundus, the demon that killed his family, is now free and trying to break into the human world. The two of them travel to an island with a castle. This is the place Mundus is trying to break through, and they plan to stop him. Dante fights through many of Mundus' servants and explores the never-ending castle on this quest. Through this journey, he finds new weapons here and there, he battles tons of bosses, one who ends up actually being his brother that he thought was dead, and he also gets betrayed. But, by the end of this long journey, he is able to battle Mundus. Dante successfully reseals him, and is able to escape the island with Trish, leaving them to run their business now called Devils Never Cry. Why didn't they call the game Devils Never Cry then? Well, it should have been flipped, right? Like, maybe I sound stupid, but why, why not make it Devils Never Cry and then after this scene change it? Dante. 
Trish, devils never cry. These tears, tears are a gift only humans have. Just change it, the devil may cry. <clears throat> the game, the game, uh, the game. What do I think? It's actually great. It ended up being way better than I originally remember it being. I enjoyed it so much more this time around. The combat is absolutely the star of the show here. And there are so many features in the combat that just made it even better. My favorite is probably the huge arsenal Dante has at his disposal. Dante starts with this standard sword. It's your standard hack and slash sword. But it's really surprising in a scene I forgot is Dante impaling himself. And he just takes the sword to use. My favorite weapon, personally, was the Flaming Ifrin Gauntlets. I really got the most fun out of them. I thought they were really good to kind of just use their charge attacks, use their rush style attacks to get some nice combos. And this leads me to the overall combat system. The game gives you so much. You have guns, swords, you have Devil Trigger, which, because Dante is a half-demon, he has a demon form. You have all of this at your disposal, but what is your goal? It's not like your standard hack and slash action game where you know you just beat them up you get through the enemies and you're done no you were actually encouraged to get as good at the combat as possible because there's a style ranking i really didn't i didn't really remember this too much for some reason it ended up really making the combat for me it was fun it really made me like actually try to go all out and it made me take combat encounters that i may have just ran past instead it really left a good impression for me and actually excited to see how they improve over this. But I talked a bit about Dante's swords and like his melee weapons, but that's not even it. Dante just carries around every gun you can think of. A fucking alien gun, the classic ebony and ivory, you know, and a grenade launcher. <laughs> of course, he's got a grenade launcher. You have so much in your pockets, you can't grow tired of the fighting. So, with all these weapons, you gotta have some good bosses on. I'd hope that the bosses are fun. So we start with Phantom. As Dante traverses the castle, he runs into Phantom. This is the first of Mundus' servants. He's this huge spider thing with tons of lava all over him. And he has this cool voice. I like his voice. He's a really cool, but simple design. I love it. He's the first boss, so he's actually really easy. I don't know why I remember having a really difficult time with all the bosses from this game. Because I beat Phantom first try if I remember correctly. He appears a few times and he's eventually reduced to a normal enemy. But overall, it's a really cool boss. And when Dante does actually beat him, the scene where he beats him is one of my favorite scenes from the game. With Phantom defeated, Dante runs straight into a legendary Dark Knight. My favorite boss, Nilo Angelo. Presented through the game as like a rival for Dante, you fight him multiple times and his difficulty scales with Dante. So as you upgrade Dante and his weapons, Nilo Angelo gets more difficult too. But what I love most about this boss is the lore. He really seems like he's the only like obvious lore heavy boss in the game. And by the end, after multiple clashes, he drops this amulet. This amulet is the other half of an amulet Dante carries the whole game. The other half belonging to his twin brother. Nilo Angelo is an overtaken, corrupted Virgil. It's so cool to see how this happens later after playing 3, it easily seals him as my favorite. 
There's two other minion type bosses that Dante fights in this game. The first is Griffin, who's a bird type thing, a mythical Griffin, of course. And he gets shredded every time you fight him. He reoccurs, he's easy. While Nightmare, on the other hand, is the opposite. And he's not hard because he's hard, he's hard because he's stupid and gimmicky. You have to hit these things in the arena while he's literally trying to send you to hell. And then you he opens this core up and you have to hack and slash your way through. The game doesn't really work with this type of boss. It, it shouldn't have ever been put in the game. And in the last time you fight him, after you fight him basically three missions in a row, Trish pops in. And it's for like a second. And I, I don't like it. I don't like Trish. So I'll come back to that later. I don't want to talk about it right now. But moving on is Mundus, the big baddie of the game. The reason Dante is even on this quest in the first place. I like this boss fight. It's not the best fight in the game, but I really like it. It revolves around Dante's Devil Trigger heavily, which I like to imagine is a way to create like some type of image of like, he's a good demon, although he has demonic powers and he can still push away the true evil, even if they are using the same power at the end of the day. I really doubt it's that deep, but I don't know, I'm probably giving this game too much credit. The first phase isn't really that bad, it's long and it can really like drain you out of your resources, but the second phase is annoying. It relies heavily on your devil trigger, but by this point I had so many items saved up from my whole playthrough, I was able to just go crazy and push right past him. There's a small section at the end where you really seal him, and it's nothing really to mention, it just gives Dante this really sick moment. Like we have a winner. Jack. Goodbye. And when you do come back. Give my regards to my son, will ya? But that's really enough about the main game. Let's talk about some of my dislikes. And there's two really main things. Is the inclusion of the underwater levels. As I've played through all the games and at the time of recording, these games have one like prevalent issue that comes up in every game. The level system constantly like ruins the flow of the games and these underwater levels are that in this game they put them in and they're not fun the controls suck and if you've played them you know exactly what i mean like they just they suck you know man and my biggest dislike of the game is trish okay okay starting this trish rant thing is that she disappears for the whole game Dante doesn't question it at all, considering she told him about this in the first place, brought him to the island, and she reappears as a boss fight. Not a proper boss fight, just for a second. She's an enemy now. To be fair, we did get a few little cutscenes and dialogue that explains that she's actually a servant of Mundus, and that's, that's fair. But that doesn't really do anything when Dante hasn't questioned it the whole game. But in the eventual boss fight, Dante does beat her, and it gives me my favorite scene in this Dante. game. This is my favorite cutscene. Dante, why did you save my life? Because you look like my mother. Now get out of my sight. The next time we meet, it won't be like this. Come any closer, you devil! You may look like my mother, but you're nowhere close to her! You have no soul. You have the face, but you'll never have her fire! Then she reappears, this time captured by Mundus. Mundus tells Dante that she was created in the image of his mother to trick him. And that gives a great explanation for her character, but I wish that was it. We have her save Dante for some reason. 
and he cries over it even though like five seconds before this he threatened her and all that happened there's no possible way for me to see these events as like enjoyable and this sucks for me because i like trisha's design and her voice i feel like just fits the look of her character i feel like the only reason they decided to let her live and keep her included in the ending was because they wanted to like give dante like a sidekick type thing but finally, with everything considered, Devil May Cry receives a score of 60 from me. 60 out of 100. This is really just because I can't ever see myself coming back to this title. With the exception of the designs and the art style of the game and the combat, can't forget the combat, it's just an average 2000s title for me. There's nothing that stands out. There's this thing that I also want to mention, I don't know how to explain it or really put it into words, but it's like... The mood just isn't there. It's meant to be ominous, suspenseful, but we have Dante who is all cheery and he says these silly funny things and it just it feels very off. And if I compare it to the later titles, they, they did figure it out. It took them a bit, but they figure it out. But here, it just, it feels off. I can't get the mood that I feel like I should be getting. That's how I would explain it. I don't know. There are things that I expected to stand out, like the soundtrack and the story that didn't quite deliver. Better than I remember, but nothing too special compared to other things I've played. Devil May Cry, uh, it's definitely the number one game we've played so far, but... To be completely honest, we, we haven't played any of the other games, so of course it's gonna be in first. Let's just get started on two. <sighs> I'm gonna say the obvious. Devil May Cry 2 fucking sucks. <laughs> And while I'm gonna shit on it, I really want to lay out what the making of this game was like. It really adds an idea of how it could have gone so wrong. The first step of DMC2's development, and probably the biggest mistake, was assembling a whole entire team who didn't work on the first one, and they didn't tell anybody from the original team of its existence. Not only is this just really wrong, it's unfair and disrespectful. Imagine putting blood, sweat, and tears into your work, having it sell perfectly, for Capcom to just start the second title, not include you, and you didn't even know of its existence. That's, that's how Devil May Cry 2 started off. But it's not even at its worst. The biggest thing to note from its development is that, apparently with only 6 months left till release, there was no actual game yet, and instead of you know, doing the logical thing and pushing a game back, poor Hidaki Isuno, I hope I'm saying that right, accredited director by this point, was basically tasked to clean up the project. This man did every single thing he could. He spent every waking minute on the project. He tried his best. And in the end, he was rewarded for his work. Before DMC2 released, he was promised he could direct DMC3. He could direct the next game. Time eventually ran out though, and with no other option, everything ended up rushed, ported, or cut from the game. And in the end, Devil May Cry 2 released January 25th, 2003 to tons of terrible reviews. Now with me talking about Devil May Cry, it was more like straightforward because the game was just fairly average. I didn't have anything I extravagantly liked, it was just a few points I wanted to talk about. But Devil May Cry 2 is different because all around, I feel like everything bad has been said about this game. So I'm going to talk about the bad some more. And we're going to start with this game's lack of life. There's no feeling, no heart, and this game is pointless. I don't, I, I just don't see a reason to play this game. We follow Dante still, but he's significantly dumbed down. He's dull and he's, he's boring. I don't know what led them to pull all of his personality traits away maybe a lack of writing time or something i don't know but when he does speak which is rarely by the way the lines suck and they 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 just they cause me to cringe looks like it's your lucky day the game is actually different than devil may cry one though there's two playable campaigns, and I only played through Dante's to be fair, because, well, you, you understand it, I didn't, I didn't enjoy the game. 
I hear Lucia's campaign follows similar missions and is overall a bit shorter, so I feel like I can't be missing too much, but I'm gonna be fair and say it could maybe be better than his. Dante's campaign starts with him meeting a group of humans who apparently fought alongside Sparta. An elder lady asks Dante if he will defeat Arius, a businessman trying to summon a demon, or he might be a demon, I, I don't have any idea. Arius, who looks like he's trying to be some kind of vampire, commands a company called Ouroboros, which all I could think about every time I heard that was the Wesker clip, so... Dante goes on this huge 18 mission journey that there's really nothing to say about. Most of these missions really feel empty, and they end with a boss that is incredibly easy or confusing, and at times I had a lot of weird glitchy bugginess happen to me. Sadly, there's no moments here really that remind me of what Devil May Cry 1 was. Dante doesn't feel like a living person and not one moment expresses any of the personality that Devil May Cry was filled with. It's, it's upsetting. Dante eventually reaches Arius and beats him, with no effort, no cool moments, just nothing. And this sucks considering he's literally the big bad boss for this whole game. But with Arius gone, Lucia, who's revealed to be Arius' daughter at some point in the game, wants Dante to kill her. But who cares about that, right guys? Who cares? A big portal to hell opens and after a coin toss, Dante dives in, starting the actual final boss. Can you guess what the final boss is? It's just a pile of goop with every boss attached. None of these bosses are special enough to even talk about. So why would I want to fight them again? While the bosses in the first game weren't top tier, they were still fun and I wanted to talk about them, which is why I did. None of that exists in this game. They're so pointless. I don't know how you wouldn't see this issue making the game. But what did they decide to do with these bosses? Reuse them and make the mess that is the final boss. And finally when you do slug your way through the mess, you are rewarded with a battle against the demon. He's just a glowing ball of light. It's lazy, he doesn't even have a design. At least the cutscene where Dante beats him is cool. It's one of the coolest scenes of this game, I'll, I'll give it credit. And as you can tell, I didn't really pay attention to the story. That really may seem unfair, but I'm trying to be truly honest about my experience with Devil May Cry 2. That experience was me finding the story super unappealing to the point where I didn't even want to pay attention. And we're gonna get even harsher now. Not only was the story dull, the characters were boring. The gameplay, it got even worse. I, I don't know what to say. Let's look at this stinger. Why does it look like that? Gameplay feels super sluggish, Dante moves like a rock, and it overall seems like it wants to be a super slow version of what the first game was. The overall flow that the first game had is just lost here. It's not good, it just it doesn't feel good in any way. And then there's a huge amount of small little changes that I feel like wouldn't have been much effort to fix going into this game that there really wasn't there. For example, two big things were the camera. The camera I was really hoping would be improved. It wasn't very good in the first game. It's just, it feels like it got even worse here. The other big one, which I really wanted a roll button, and they did that. They added a dodge button. But while the dodge button is there, it's, it's terrible. You get more use out of jumping or just literally walking out of the way because the enemies don't pose a threat at all. Now, I played on normal, and that caused the game to feel like it was trying to feed me Play-Doh. 
The enemies suck, they don't do anything, they fill up your screen, and you repeatedly have to use the boring combat to plow through them for almost 20 missions. I'd really hope at least the weapons were fun, but in my experience, I found every enemy could just easily get shredded if I just spammed ranged weapons. The bosses too. I could just use Dante's trusty old pistols and beat everything in this game. There's weapons like a rocket and a shotgun, but they kind of just- everything just kind of sucks compared to the pistols. There's the blades, which there's only blades. There's no other special type of weapons in this game. There's three swords, and so, you know, I'd hope that if there's only three, they're crazy. Crazy as possible. Oh, they're, they're all the exact same. In their descriptions, they say they differ, but I absolutely noticed nothing. It really made me sad because, you know, one of my favorite parts about the original Devil May Cry was getting a weapon and seeing what I could do with it. And you can't do that here. One of the last things I really disliked too was instantly having everything unlocked. The game promotes you to use the red orbs to power up weapons and strength instead of just buying new moves. You start with every single move. This ruins the progression for me as like it was so excited to get a new weapon and seeing what I can slap on it, what I can do, and what playstyle the game like kind of suggests for me. But that idea is completely missing here. It's really no fun. The main thing I took from Devil May Cry was the combat, you know, and it left me disappointed here. There's really no redeeming points I can find, and I'm trying to find them, but to be honest, there's no positives. It's not fun but raiding devil may cry 2 is hard and there's really no being nice about this i'm giving it a 15 i never want to play this video game again and i don't think i will ever have a reason to thankfully the positives i can give this game are basically non-existent and the main things are is that the game had so many moments that i laughed because they were just weird and Dante's design is cool. I will say that Dante's design that they gave him in this game is one of my favorite designs I've ever seen of Dante. Out of everything I've seen, this is a really good design for him. That's pretty much it. I'm, I'm just ready to move on. I'm tired of talking about this game. And we're finally on to what is probably the most popular popular and well-loved game in the franchise devil may cry 3 meanwhile for me it's definitely the most troubling so far up to this point it was just an average title to me and i didn't think that would change keep in mind i went from devil may cry 1 which wasn't the best to devil may cry 2 which was the worst of course, I, at this time, when opening the game, had a kind of bad expectations. When I played it years ago, I don't remember much, and I don't remember enjoying it. I just remember playing it. But to get started, Devil May Cry 3 was destined for greatness from the very beginning. The project was led by the legendary Hidaki Itsuno and began right after 2 was finished. It eventually released in February 2005 and instantly became immensely loved and still is considered a classic you have to play. Basically, the complete opposite of what my thoughts were in the past. But spoiler alert, that definitely changed this time around. Before I get ahead of myself, let me just lay the game out. In this adventure, we go back in time. We see a young Dante who just opened his shop, when all of a sudden, a tower just spurts out of the ground. And with that, he is also approached by Arkham, a human that I believe was taken over by a demon. He might have always been one, it doesn't really matter. Arkham works with Dante's twin brother, Virgil, and they want to reunite the demon world and human world to make a gateway between them, basically. That's what the tower does. And so, Dante starts to make his way up to the tower, which is greatly designed, and he eventually is face-to-face -face with his twin. And after a beautiful duel, Dante awakens his devil trigger. We 
should leave. For the moment, we have all that we need. Dante is now back at the bottom of the tower, and Virgil is now in possession of his amulet. Dante starts to climb back up, and Virgil begins to open the gateway. Dante has to traverse the tower some more, but he eventually finds Virgil again, and he's trying to open the gateway. The twins yet again duel, and god, these fights are so great. Oh, but they, they are betrayed by Arkham, who has been planning this whole entire thing out. Easy to see twist, but it's still very cool. With this, Dante travels into hell after Arkham, finds him, and him and Virgil team up to finally defeat him. The brothers cannot stay on good terms though, as they must have a final duel, right at the gateway to the underworld. In one of my favorite battles ever in any video game, Dante brings Virgil to his knees. Ending with a beautiful moment, Virgil casts himself into hell seeking more power. Dante now leaving the tower meets up with Lady and decides on a name for his shop. And that's our ending to Devil May Cry 3, a real beautiful one and one I loved a lot more this time around. I know that was the most basic explanation of the story and I missed so much, but that's because I want to talk a bit about each of the bigger bits and some of the things that I've really enjoyed about this story. On this journey Dante goes on, he meets so much randomness. He meets a jester that is Arkham in disguise, a lady who swears to kill Arkham, and of course Virgil. Everybody that Dante meets helps to create this story's biggest themes. This is the first game to feature really obvious themes, and it works hard to present the simple themes of family and acceptance. I love this because it just it makes everybody feel complete, and it feels like everybody has a role and a purpose in moving Dante throughout the game, as he's the main character. Dante runs after Virgil originally just to one-up him, to fuel this sibling rivalry. A selfish and immature reason, but it reflects who we know Dante is at that point. And throughout this story, this changes, not because of anything he really does, but because of everybody he interacts with and what he goes through. Shortly into the tower, Dante meets Mary, who is Lady. He calls her Lady. She's on this quest to kill Arkham, the demon who is attempting to use Virgil. He was a devil-worshipping human, and he was also Lady's father. She yearns for revenge against him because he killed her mother. She's after her father while Dante is after Virgil. Virgil himself seeks power. He seeks it because this is how he copes with his mother's death. He blames it on himself being weak. He wants to open this portal to hell, and this itself puts a stain on their whole family. Dante witnesses these acts, and with every interaction with Lady, he changes. She's obsessed with their family situation, wanting revenge on Arkham for his sins against her family. She constantly pushes this in his face, and Dante kind of starts to think about his own situation. His brother on a path of self-destruction, thinking about only power, and there's a demon trying to become a false Sparta. Both of these ruining his family's legacy, something he begins to realize is important and something he cares for. Dante eventually accepts his family, his demon roots, his human roots, and even proudly calls himself a son of Sparta. We are the sons of Sparta. Within each of us flows his blood. But more importantly, his soul! And now, my soul is saying it wants to stop you! He does the story Dante's way, eventually finding acceptance and understanding his family, in the funny way we all love to see. And it's not a complicated or intricate theme, but it's perfect for this game. It's not too complicated for me to understand, but big enough for me to smile and want to talk about it. The story left a great mark on me. Compare it to DMC 1, which had a story, but it was all over the place, and then DMC 2, which shouldn't have even existed. 3 presents the first complete tale in this world, and I loved every bit of it. 
Virgil and Lady are excellent characters to star alongside Dante against Arkham, who himself isn't my favorite villain, but he's a good enough force for the story to move on. They each add so much and it makes me so happy to finally have characters in these games that I feel like are as cool as Dante and that I can care as much as Dante. And it shouldn't have taken 3 games for me to feel like this way, but yeah. Finally moving on from all the story bits, we're moving on to, as I said in DFC 1, the most important part. The combat. It delivers. Lawlessly. The combat here is miles ahead of anything presented in the first two games. It's stylish, still featuring the amazing style system, and making it better to work with. Every single element Devil May Cry combat is known for has been vastly improved, and it's almost to a point where it feels like it was completely overhauled, but it's still great and still recognizable as Devil May Cry. I say this really because there's major changes like a brand new style system that is completely new to DMC3. It basically changes the B button into a style button. Depending on your style, which there's six to choose from, you get a move that represents that style. I personally chose to stick to Trickster. Trickster is probably the simplest style as it gives you a dash and tons of extra mobility. I used it as like a roll button to dodge, but when I unlock the teleport dash ability it gets, I used it a lot. And I know you can get real crazy with these styles, but you can't equip more than one at a time. And since I was doing one playthrough, I stuck with what was comfortable to me. Now, you have these styles to pair with the new weaponry changes. And by changes, I mean you can not only hold multiple weapons, but seamlessly change them in combat. Being able to hold four weapons now, two ranged, two melee, is great. This leads to so much experimentation with what weapons I enjoyed together. My main melee ended up being good old rebellion and my favorite ranged weapon was probably the sniper rifle. A weapon I actually never found in my playthrough and I'm happy I found it this time around. I love this change because being able to hold multiple weapons in combat is great but being able to switch them is even better. It improves on the combos and kind of just gives you a way to express like your own style in a fight almost. It's, it makes the fights look so much better. I just wish I could change them in my inventory rather than have to go out of my way and use a statue. There's so many of them so it works alright but it's still a little annoying. Each weapon is flashy, unique in its own way, and great. I love that Dante acquires them from bosses most of the time, and that the weapons also perfectly represent what boss they dropped from. My favorite example of this is probably Agnia Rudra, as they're hilarious. And my name is Rudra. You shall take us with you. We can be a great help to you. Okay, but on one condition. What is it? Name it! No, talking. Fair enough. As you wish. This happens multiple times with a ton of the weapons in this game, and it really adds personality and almost adds another layer of fun to each of them, because it's cool to see how they represent the boss they came from. As I said before, I had a blast with the sniper, which can be found naturally, but there's other cool ranged weapons like the classic ebony and ivory, or the rocket launcher lady just gives to you. Going back to the melee weapons, Beowulf is one of the really cool ones. Basically, during the boss fight, he escapes from Dante and finds Virgil, and Virgil just finishes him off in one strike. And when Dante and Virgil fight again, Virgil uses Beowulf against you. But after the fight, you can acquire it for yourself. And that's really cool, it makes the weapon like feel so special to get. Some of the weapons are more complicated to use, like Navan. I probably could have learned them if I took some time, but I'm playing 6 games for this video, so I'm not trying to like spend 20 plus hours in each game. But just like before, I found myself looking for excuses to fight. I even tried the bloody palace mode for once. With the weapon selection being the biggest it's ever been, the combat being the smoothest yet, and all the new additions that feel perfect for the game, I really can't say this is the best Devil May Cry combat experience yet. The combat is rewarded with a great selection of bosses and mostly great enemies. My favorite bosses were obviously the Virgil fights, but there's a lot of other great fights and some not so great. Arkham. 
With the amount of great fights in the game, I feel like it can be super easy to forget the bad, and to be fair, there is a handful of bosses that I feel like are bad. Hell Vanguard is technically a boss, they have a health bar and everything, even though it never really feels like a boss, they count as one. Garion and Gigapede kinda suck, they're not really enjoyable to fight, and they're just there. Doppelganger is the most gimmicky fight in the game, and I feel like once you figure it out, he also becomes the easiest fight in the game. So... Oh, wait. I almost forgot about Leviathan, which is just a slugfest. You just hit and hit and hit and hit. It's so easy, it's forgetful. But moving on to the good fights, there's a lot of amazing fights here. Cerberus is the first real boss you come across, and you can definitely tell. He's a steep increase in difficulty right off the bat, and compared to my arsenal at the time, it was super hard to beat him. But when I finally got him, it was so worth it to see Dante get him as a weapon. It's the first time this happens. Agnia Rudra as well as Navon are all similar. They become weapons after defeated. And while I wouldn't say they're as hard as Cerberus the first time around, I don't remember Navon being that difficult. This time it took me about an hour to beat her. I couldn't get her moves down, but it shouldn't have taken that long. But she's still a good boss regardless. Beowulf is great too, and while I'm not going to say much because I talked about them earlier, the boss fight is just as good as their weapon. Oh, and then there's a lady boss fight, which is a simple gimmick where you basically just chase her around the arena. It's a much more entertaining gimmick than Doppelganger. It's not amazing, but the fight means a lot, which kind of makes me like the fight a lot more. Now, we're moving on to the Virgil bosses. Obviously the best fights and the most enjoyable. Everything they showcase, the difficulty, and everything they provide for the story is just, it's amazing. Dante and Virgil are both battling to be different than one another, and I think that's obvious considering they literally wear the opposite colors. But still, they are siblings, and it's so cool to see that through these fights. For example, when Dante gets Beowulf, he uses them the exact same way Virgil did in the boss fight you just had. I remember fighting Virgil years ago, and loving these boss fights then. But I also remember hating how difficult it was. I feel like that feeling really came from me not trying to understand the game and not understanding the point of his fights for like the story. Looking at it now, it's still of course frustrating, but the difficulty adds to it. I love it. And if it's going to be the hardest fight, it might as well be the most important one. Of course Virgil's going to be the hardest fight. It's the most important fight to the story, and I love that he's just genuinely a hard boss. No gimmicks, no glitches, just Virgil, a flawless example of a main boss for a game. You can also play as Virgil, you basically redo the story with some exclusive cutscenes. His moveset is very different than Dante's, and he uses most of the moves he uses in the boss fights. He is very silent though, or maybe I didn't play enough. When you fight against him, he talks a lot when he uses Devil Trigger and stuff for example, but he doesn't do any of that when you play as him. <laughs> I do hear though that playing as Virgil is way better in the up and coming titles, so I'll, I'll explore him more then. Oh, and I think we're forgetting someone. Jester slash Arkham is interesting. If you played the game, you know the tragedy that is the Arkham boss fight. But I've never really heard anything about the Jester fights in comparison. The Jester fights are fun and simple. They're nothing really to get excited for like some of the other bosses. They kind of just exist. But Arkham on the other hand is the weirdest case. He's the hidden villain for the whole game and he eventually accomplishes his goal basically. So when you fight him, you really expect him to be special, you know? But it's this thing. A blend of one color that's a ball of mush. He kind of reminds me of the final boss for DMC2. I also hate that when you get to the second phase, Virgil joins you. And while that's meant to be super hype and sick, it ends up being annoying. Is it because you can't use Devil Trigger anymore and you lose your style button? By the time I beat the boss, I wasn't even excited that they're working together anymore. It just, it sucked. At least we got this cutscene where we finally get to see the twins work together. Jackpot. Not very clever. 
classy for someone's dying words. While there are some terrible bosses, like I said before, there's so many great ones that it's easy to forget the bad. The balance really works. There are some points where there are great bosses in a row, and even with the Arkham fight, it's between two great bosses. So it ends up working really well, and it never really feels like they're terrible. I can definitely say these are the best fights in the series so far. I don't even know how they're going to top this, but I guess I'm going to have to see. Enough about these bosses though. Level design and the soundtrack are both things I enjoyed, and both are way better than the last games. The soundtrack is great, and that's been my opinion since I first played the game. Tracks like Devils Never Cry are so good. I want to play more, but I can't because of copyright, but that's just one of the many great tracks. Currently, it's my favorite soundtrack in the series compared to 1 and 2, but I actually remember enjoying 4's soundtrack like the most, so we'll see. Level design is also something that's amazing here. Navigating the tower and the areas involved is a blast, even though I can get confused and I probably got lost over 10 times, the playable world is awesome. While I didn't talk about it much while I was at DMC1, I really found myself lost and confused at the puzzles that game featured more than I probably should've. That problem is solved here and most of the puzzles feel like they wrap themselves up well enough and the puzzles are fun and simple. The level design still does seem to ruin the flow though. Not every level is bad, but this is the third game with this flow issue and it doesn't seem to be getting better. There's always these levels that just seem like they're either put there so they could have another level or because they ran out of ideas. This huge parkour segment is a perfect example. I hate cruising through levels fully focused and immersed to come across a level that just doesn't belong, especially towards the end of the game. Sections like these seem to be a running theme in these games. There's also tons of enemies that feel like they stop you in your tracks the same way. Ones where you have to shoot them or they're invincible, and like these chess enemies, like really? But that's it. There's no huge huge complaints for this game like the other ones. There's just little nitpicks here and there that I could probably give you more of, but that's not necessary to talk about. Considering this section was way longer than 1 and 2, I think it's fair to say I actually really enjoyed Devil May Cry 3 this time around. This is the first game that has really changed my opinion. Before, I probably wouldn't have much to say about it. I don't even have any idea why it wasn't for me then. But I'm just going to give it a 90. It exceeded my expectations and more. The revisit really let me know that Devil May Cry 3 was way better than I gave it credit for. I will definitely be coming back to this one. And I probably would still be playing off and on right now if this didn't happen. Wait. No, I just. I just overwrote my save with Bert. Oh my god, I'm an idiot. Why did I do that? Uh, Virgil. Yep. I really love this one. Alright, but it's about that time. Let's move on. On to the next game. Now this is where I took a turn. After playing 3, you know, I would normally go on to 4 if we're playing in order of release. But I really wasn't looking forward to that game. My memories of DMC4 are terrible. And so I'm literally right in the middle of all the games. I decided we're going to throw in the wild card and we're going to play the reboot. A title I've never touched, don't know too much about, and I bought it just for this video. Got it on sale though. DMC Devil May Cry, don't forget the lowercase m, is developed by Ninja Theory. A studio brought in to create this reboot for Capcom. 
After 4 release, the sales really didn't meet Capcom's expectations. Considering it was the first game to be on every platform, not just PS2, they expected more. They wanted it to sell as well as games like Call of Duty and other big games at the time, but it just didn't. It was still niche, it wasn't huge. So what did they do? They decided to go in a new direction. They announced a reboot. They brought Ninja Theory in, told them to create their vision of Devil May Cry, and it released in January 2013. Featuring a whole different style of Devil May Cry, it was met with tons of hate. You know, as you would kind of expect, a cult fan base, when you change something huge, isn't gonna like it. The hate was absolutely crazy. I would say it honestly got out of hand, it got way too deep, but regardless if the hate was warranted or not, the game did have a lot wrong. For my playthrough, I played the Definitive Edition, which released 2015. Apparently it fixed tons of issues the game had, and thanks to that, I can't speak much on the issues this game released with, but I hear it was absolutely terrible. Even 10 years after its release, it still keeps this negative aura, and many DMC fans don't consider it, like, part of the franchise. Which, honestly, these are the things that made me so interested and excited to play this game. Hopping straight into the story, we see our brand new Dante. And in this kind of weird intro that doesn't explain anything, but it's really cool, it sets this crazy dark grunge tone for this game. I really love how he pulls the sword out of the sigil on his back. That's really cool. I like it. Besides the randomness, Dante is saved by Cat, a human who can traverse to Limbo and back, and Limbo is pretty much the space between realms. She takes him to meet Virgil, and um, that's definitely different. And with that, Virgil takes Dante to learn of his roots. He's a Nephilim, a mix of demon and angel. He also learns a bit about his parents and like Mundus' involvement with them and he learns that Virgil is his brother basically so. So the trio move to take Mundus down and free the human race. They start tearing down his biggest companies and even his news network and all is well until Cat is captured. And this is where things turn. Virgil doesn't seem to care but Dante is fired up and he quickly works to take Cat back. How does Dante do that, you ask? He just kidnaps Mundus' unborn child, and when they negotiate a trade, Virgil just kills the kid. But with Cat back, they create plans to actually kill Mundus, and they get started. The twins infiltrate the tower and battle Mundus, finally ending his rule. And as it seems the human race is finally free... Oh, there was a miscommunication. Apparently Virgil just wanted Mundus gone so he could rule. Him and Dante, as he sees humans as insignificant. Dante is pissed off, well, because Cat, a human, helped them this whole time. Virgil is just oblivious to this, or, well, he, he doesn't care. And he forces Dante into battle. Dante leaves Virgil on the edge of death as he leaves, and that's the ending of the story. A very, very, very simple story with an obvious twist. We all seen it coming. This is the perfect example of mediocre. Not a bad story, not a great story, just very, very, very meh. The main idea of a character learning is special, becomes the hero who learns something about himself and that makes him want to take down the big villain is cool, but done terribly here. It's a very common trope, but that's for a reason. It's popular, it works very well, it creates amazing stories, but it can also result in some of the most generic and bland creations. Nothing evolves throughout this story. Everything stays at the very beginning stage. 
The game's opening had me hooked. I'm not gonna lie. I, I wanted to play more. I was excited. A unique look, a new take on the familiar world, and everything else. I really liked what I was seeing. But as it moved forward, it never expanded past that basic hero story. We get introduced to Kat, and it's great to see Dante showing interest in her. You know, they have little talks and little conversations that are funny, but after the few, first few missions, that just stops. And she's only shown beat up, kidnapped, and she's only used from that point forward as a way for Dante to get places. Being one of the three main characters, she's reduced to nothing instantly. Virgil is shown and basically only betrays Dante. That's the one and only big thing he does. It makes sense for his character, but that's only if you compare it to the original Virgil from DMC3. But he's supposed to be his own thing here, right? We're not- this is a reboot, its own story. Why- why compare it? Nothing to explain himself is shown. What has he done since he was a kid? How big is this order he's created? These simple small moments could build from these questions and make him enjoyable. But yet again, the story never leaves the simple main ideas. We compared this to Dante, Dante we learned so much about him because we play him the whole game. And while his story itself isn't amazing, it's nothing perfect, it's kind of basic, I do like his personality in this game. I feel like I'm literally the only person I've ever seen say that, but I love his personality here. Humor is subjective and I find the quick to the point and asshole remarks form of Dante hilarious. You know what your problem is? <laughs> You're too clingy! I think you're all mixed up. While he really does fail to hit the mark often and have normal sounding conversations, I got plenty enjoyment out of this version of him. As for the looks of all the characters, I know it was an attempt to change it up, fit the game's style, but I just I can't get used to it. I really enjoy the almost classy looking long red coat Dante. The look just doesn't work without the red. The other Devil May Cry characters don't even look like their original forms, and don't get me started on Virgil. That's not my Virgil. But other than a lot of the understandingly annoying differences, I don't think this game is completely terrible. I do understand a lot of the hate, as you can't take a loved franchise with tons of characters and elements, you know, stuff people love, and just disrespect it. At the same time, I feel like people refuse to look past some of the surface issues and see that maybe there isn't such a bad game here. Not terrible, but not great, and it could probably be a lot better to be honest. The main issues stem from the fact that there's other DMC games to compare it to. And yeah, it absolutely sucks if you compare it to them. My point is basically that if this wasn't a DMC title and was its own thing, it probably would be a lot better. I found the level design great and the gameplay easy but it was still fun and the soundtrack for this game is probably its strongest point, it's super good. All of the elements you play through feel great, it's just everything else I want to get attached to doesn't exist. They can make a game feel great to play, but terrible at the same time, if that makes sense. Going in depth, in order, the level design and the look of the game is super nice to look at. The art style is actually very unique, the punk and grungy type of look this game features is super fresh to look at. And the environments are the same, they feel fresh, and they were something I was very surprised to see in a game that is actually like over 10 years old by now. I found most of the levels were consistently good, and I could even compare them to levels from newer games. They all are bright, they're beautiful, especially levels featuring Limbo. It's very pretty, every level felt absolutely gorgeous, and I felt like I could get lost in how good it looked, I, I really like that part of it. And the gameplay looks just as good. But before I really get in depth with the combat and other elements that Devil May Cry has, I want to say the game is super easy. You know, I started with the highest difficulty you can by default, even though there's like three higher ones that I haven't unlocked yet, and I missed the harder elements a lot. Especially the bosses. The bosses felt like absolute cakewalks and I really didn't like that. I'm not going to play through the game again on a harder difficulty. It's just, it's not worth it. 
Not much of the basic combat has changed though. There's still a style system, still multiple weapons, and it's still hack and slash the enemies and bosses. Because Dante is an angel and a demon, the game kind of uses this idea in a unique way. You can access power from both sides using each trigger on the controller, RT, LT, whatever. Angel types on one side, demon sides on the other sides. And angel weapons tend to strike faster but do less damage, and demon weapons are heavier and they do more damage but they're slower. In combination with these weapons, there's a grab for each type, one that pulls you to them, and one that pulls them to you. Having each type available at all time, as well as the basic DMC-like abilities, makes this game feel rather easy. I'm not a DMC combat expert, so you would really expect me to have more fun if I'm having an easier time getting higher numbers, right? But no, it really didn't feel like that. I feel like with DMC, the challenge really adds to it. You know, it makes each combo feel more rewarding. The style ranking you get for the combo feel more rewarding. And when I'm constantly getting S, SS, whatever, it doesn't really feel rewarding. There's no moments where I'm like, damn, I'm getting shit on or something. Like, you need those moments to make the good moments even better. That's the issue with how easy this combat is. Another thing is by the time I was finished with the Virgil DLC, I could tell if I played any more of this combat, I was just, I, I wasn't going to be able to do it anymore. It got so boring by the end. I would easily say I prefer 3's combat over this because it just feels deeper. 3 features the styles, more weapons, a better flow, and it's just, it's harder, it works better. The combat is still very solid though, don't let my opinion on the difficulties change that. I would say it's great for a hack and slash, compared to other random hack and slashes I've played, I would probably say I enjoyed this more. But if I compare it to the other DMC games, which we kind of have to, it only feels super average. The weapons themselves are okay. I really do miss the fun way of obtaining weapons from bosses or in crazy cutscenes, but they kind of just poof into your inventory in this game. Dante starts with the classic Rebellion, Ebony and Ivory, and the weapons then split into the angel and demon forms. He gains a scythe, these shuriken things, an axe, a pair of gauntlets, and for ranged weapon, there's the shotgun and a grenade launcher. Just some pretty basic weapons. Now, for the feel of the weapons, they're just meh. As I said, they kind of just poof out of nowhere. There's no fun introductions, but they do work really well in this game. The synchronization between all the weapons in this game is probably the best so far, but I think that could just be a product of the game being newer and having a better engine. I don't know for sure though. I never really found myself wanting to use a weapon over another as, I don't know, they, just something about them didn't make a single weapon too likable. Splitting Dante's moveset between angel and demon counterparts works great until type specific enemies show up. They also use this split in the platforming. All of the traversal sections use the angel and demon split and it makes it tons of fun actually. Whether you're pulling something out of the way fast, launching yourself, or just climbing, it really creates a fun platforming experience that feels like free and fun. I would almost say they should have just made a platforming game. <laughs> just just Ninja Theory, make a platforming game with these pretty ass levels. You got the world design and the pretty levels down. Just, just put your platforming in there too and like, I would play that. Back to the Angel and Demon counterparts. It works great in all the systems until the type specific enemies show up. There's only two of them. So like, how can it be so annoying? Well, they completely stop the combat. They stop you right in your tracks, and it completely ruins everything I have going for me if I manage to hit one of these enemies. It's not fun. I feel like they could have used this system so much better. But other than type-specific enemies, most of the enemies featured are just fodder. As I said before, the game is really easy, so you just cut down everything really fast. Uh, well, okay, whatever, whatever, whatever. Just make the bosses hard, but they aren't. And it sucks because there's actually some fun, unique bosses in here. While not many, I wish the bosses I liked were challenging. Bob Barvis is probably the best boss in the game. He's absolutely hilarious. The worst of them is Dante, 
the whole world would benefit greatly by his non-existence. I'm taking you off the air. And he just, he's, he's fun to fight against. He's, he's definitely the best boss. Succubus was cool. I really liked that fight because of the platforming and stuff in the arena and kind of just like the grappling and stuff. I, I liked it. Mundus, on the other hand, which is the scary boss, the main enemy, is the most generic giant boss fight I've ever played. Like seriously, this is the most underwhelming and boring boss ever. Now the final boss, Virgil, his fight is cool. The cutscenes are nice, but the fight doesn't really land for me. There's just not enough to his character in the game for me to be excited about this duel. And that's kind of all I want to talk about with the combat and gameplay. A lot of it is really generic, and it sucks because in terms of artistic vision, I think this game excels and really could have been something. They had so much going for it in the like artistic department. Other than the world design, the soundtrack is another great example of this. It's definitely different being mainly electronic with rock mixed in here and there, just atmospheric type music. It just felt so refreshing. I don't know if it's the best soundtrack so far because DMC 3's was amazing. It really wasn't terrible and it was something that really stood out to me and I found myself just like jamming along to the game, you know? But I'm, I, I'm done talking about DMC Devil May Cry. I, I enjoyed the game, that's pretty much it. I can't say that it was spectacular and with the exception of a few random things, it's probably one of the most generic games I've played all the way through. If I wasn't playing this for a video, I think I would have gotten bored and got off probably halfway through. The characters, the plot, it's okay. The gameplay is slightly above average. But when, when you put this in the DMC universe, there's like every other game is better. Well, not two. It's an experience that left me feeling a whole lot of nothing and give me six months. I, I'm, I'm not remembering anything from this game. And that's DMC. Lowercase m, don't forget, Devil May Cry. I believe it's rightfully earned its rating of 55. Not great, not good, not bad, or terrible, just extremely, extremely, extremely average and forgetful. The extra points are for the soundtrack. That's that's why it's just not getting a flat out 5, 50, whatever. But finally, we move on to 4. The game featuring my favorite Devil May Cry character, Nero. <laughs> Starting Devil May Cry 4 has me confused. On one hand, I'm extremely excited for Nero, and on the other hand, I can't remember anything about this game I actually loved. But before we get deep and we get into all of that, I want to say I did have like a big issue with this game. I couldn't figure out how to make another save, and instead of just buying the game on another platform, I didn't want to spend more money, so I played with my original save from years ago. Meaning I start the game with Nero's Devil Trigger, and when I get to Dante, I have all of his weapons right off the bat. I don't think it honestly affected anything too much, but I might as well say it. But to open DMC4, this game probably has the coolest opening out of all six. We open to Nero absolutely slaughtering these demons, one-handed and in the coolest way possible. Oh, but you can't forget that loud choir music that eventually quiets down when Nero reaches the cathedral. And just when it seems to be all calmed down, we're sitting into the game, we're soothing into it, a familiar face just crashes through the ceiling. That's our opening to DMC4. The DMC that's known as the unfinished one, and with quite a strange reputation. It's probably the game with the biggest cult fanbase besides 3, showing it's managed to stay loved despite all of its flaws. Being the first game to leave the PlayStation and release on Xbox as well as PC, DMC4 had a lot of first time viewers to impress. It also came with the news that Dante wouldn't be the main character? And that's when the trailer for the new main character Nero came out. With that, it was set in stone. Nero's game, DMC4, would release at the beginning of 2008. To no one's surprise, it released with great reviews, a new loved entry in the Devil May Cry franchise. So did it hold up to those expectations set by those reviews? Well, let's get into the plot first. 
Back to where we left off, Dante springs through the ceiling and assassinates Sanctus. Just like that, he finished the main villain. I'm, I'm kidding. This leads to our brand new main character Nero and him fighting. And of course in Dante fashion, he just messes with Nero before escaping. Nero is then tasked to track Dante and defeat him, so we travel through the world with Nero. But let's give you a bit about Nero. He is deeply in love with Kyrie, a church girl with a kind heart. Him and her brother, Credo, serve the church as their holy knights, explaining why they dispatch Nero to deal with Dante and why he's so good at combat and stuff. Eventually running into a strange underground facility, it's basically revealed that the religion Nero serves is basically full of frauds. It's all bullshit. Nero is now obviously in search of answers, and that's when he runs into Agnes, this weird and annoying scientist in possession of his sleeping Yamato. Quickly pinned to the wall, Nero seems to pass out. And this is when he recalls the moment his arm transformed. While thinking of Kyrie and the power he needs to protect her, he seems to awaken the Yamato. And if this scene didn't tell you who Nero's dad is, then you probably need all of your senses checked. Continuing on his journey, Nero runs into Dante again, but it seems like he's way less interested in actually fighting Dante and more interested in what he knows. And Nero does more traveling through this annoying jungle and he seems to reach the church's headquarters. And of course he's stopped by Credo, his Conrad and longtime friend. Credo reveals he too has undergone this weird ritual to become a demon, the same as Agnes. Now forced to fight him, Nero strikes him down, but not before Kyrie lays witness to him in his arm. Terrified. Obviously set up by Agnes, he tells Kyrie that Nero is a demon, and that she was used against Nero to cause him to chase after them. Credo and Nero go their separate ways. Credo angered that the cause he believes in used his sister, leaves, and Nero wanting to save Kyrie, chases after her. After losing another fight, and losing another chance to save Kyrie, Nero runs into Dante again, and because it's all Dante does, they fight. But to no surprise, Nero gets beaten again, that's like 6 defeats in a row. In a strange twist though, Dante lets Nero keep the Yamato, ending this scene beautifully. Hey! What's your name? Nero. You're Dante, right? Hmm, I wonder if Dante has a hunch who his father is. But Nero is now ready to stop Sanctus. Sanctus' idea is to use Nero's power to power up this crazy, weird statue thing. And to no one's surprise, Nero loses again. Nero loses a lot in this game if you couldn't tell. With his loss, Credo dies, Dante and Trish show up, and Nero gets absorbed into the thingy. And we switch to Dante as he chases after Sanctus. As Dante chases after Sanctus, there's literally nothing to talk about of importance. Like actually, we, we literally seen everything Dante does as Nero already. Catching up to Sanctus, Dante has to sadly participate in one of the worst boss fights ever. But at least he frees Nero. Nero now reawakened has to fight Sanctus, and this time he actually doesn't lose. He actually defeats Sanctus once and for all. 
Now, with the city and Kyrie saved, Nero is entrusted the Yamato by Dante. And as Dante walks off, he's sure to let the player know, me, that we'll see him again. Of course we will. And all that's left is for Nero to make up with Kyrie. And they do so in my favorite scene from this game. You're not a human anymore. Is this what you want? Nero, you're you. And it's you I want to be with. I don't know anyone who is as human as you are. And you can probably tell by my lackluster explanation, but I was tired of this plot far before I was close to even finishing this game. Starting with Nero, I understand the idea of why we changed main characters. Bringing the game to people who've never played Devil May Cry with Dante could have easily been too much, as two thirds of the players wouldn't even be able to play one through three. So they went with Nero, and I love Nero, I'm a Nero fan. But they did him so dirty. Not only did they give him the worst story to be the star in, they made him like, like kind of a loser. With the exception of the weird Hellgate bosses, which no one cares about, Nero loses every single fight. He finally beat Sanctus at the end, but that's after like Dante weakened him to shit and he lost like most of the statue. Not only was he written to go through loss, after loss, they gave him so many moments like this, where he's just in despair, crying, whatever. And by the time we're close to the end, it just, it's funny. Like, I can't take Nero being all upset serious. He's just, they, like, make him so dramatic. We really went from DMC3 to this. A poorly written mess. And it seems, in a way, to mock the obvious downgrade, they literally show us Dante right at the beginning. But, being self-proclaimed Nero's strongest soldier, I still really like Nero with this revisit to 4. While I wouldn't say he's as good as I remember him being, I still really love his hot-headed attitude. His attitude and personality drew me to him in an instant, just like it did the first time I played. He seems cool and calm, but in a snap he will rush after something angry. And many dislike these traits from Nero, and I get it. I, I see the idea of why you could just not enjoy him. He has all these down bad moments, and he can get super annoying with how dramatic he is, but regardless, his whole quest after Kyrie is just super enjoyable to me. I really did find myself wishing we had more in-game context to their relationship, as I can't help but enjoy these cheesy romance plots. You know, Nero has to save Kyrie while he doesn't even know if she'll accept him anymore. And when it does finally get resolved, oh, I loved it. It just, they're so cute. Regardless, I think we can all be honest and say Nero does have his moments. Like when he absorbs the Yamato. And I will talk about it later, but the gameplay more than makes up for Nero's story through the game. I know all about how the game really isn't finished and they probably didn't have enough time to finish writing a complete story, so I get it. I don't really want to spend my time hammering in those points because you could probably just hear that from someone else or just spend 5 minutes reading up on it yourself. The point is, it's just, I didn't enjoy it that much. That might be the reason why or maybe it's just not for me, who knows. <laughs> but if we move on to our star. Dante, he honestly also got done dirty. Besides his gameplay, which of course I'll mention later, he just got left with Nero's leftovers. In a move that I honestly didn't enjoy, he's shown 5 minutes into the game, teasing us with Dante, leaving us excited to play him. Issue is, you have to wait like 13 missions. And once you get to Dante, well, you're replaying all the missions you just went through as Nero fighting the same bosses, with the only enjoyable one being Agnes, because the ending's just hilarious. Do 
Dante is Dante in this game. What is there not to love with Dante? You can't get him wrong. He's super fun, and although he looks... Pasty? I do love his outfit here, especially those boots. <laughs> his purpose is to serve as a way to pass the torch to Nero, but I never really felt like that happened in this game. We know that they want Dante to push Nero forward like he can continue the show, but nothing Nero does proves he's ready. I'm just overall disappointed in the story and especially the way the characters were used. When talking about the story, I kept mentioning the gameplay, explicitly saying, besides the gameplay, and well, that is for a reason. The gameplay experience is a complete opposite of what I experienced with the story. Nothing about the Devil May Cry formula has changed, still hack and slash with a focus on sick combos, but DMC4 is definitely the biggest upgrade yet. The upgrade that stuck out to me the most was the visuals. This is definitely the best looking game so far. The reboot definitely had a beautiful art style and that was so nice because it was so unique. But I don't know, something about 4 just makes it feel familiar. It's more in line with what the first three games looked like. Besides normal visuals though, the animations is what I really mean. Nero slamming stuff around, Dante just flying through the air, it all looks so alive. You know, you had the normal motion capture DMC stuff, but it seems like when it comes to the combat animations, they took it a step further. They wanted each animation to feel extremely fluid and pretty. And in a game with style being the main focus, I feel like they really hit the nail on its head in this one. In the story, Nero does kind of suck. Playing him though, is really surprising. I didn't remember much about playing Nero, nothing at all really, but he's really fun. Nero's gameplay is very fast, very rush based, and you know, it makes sense with this character being hot headed, angry, and it just makes you want to play as crazy as possible. Whether it's you just streak back and forth or trying to get the perfectly timed exceeds, Nero is really a breath of fresh air compared to like always playing as Dante. His devil arm is super different, finally having the ability to pull things to you for once and then just slam them. It's, it's so fun. And then you get devil trigger and it just... It lets you do everything faster and just, oh, it's so cool. But there's always a but. Nero got old fast. And I think there's really one reason for that. In previous games, we've gotten new weapons, upgrades all throughout the story because of the story. But all Nero gets is his devil trigger. It doesn't add much other than just being a devil trigger. This leads to an experience where I finally get to play as Dante and all I can see him as is refreshing because, because Nero starts to get stale, he doesn't get anything new throughout the whole game. That sounds like it makes sense though, right? But Dante just blows Nero out of the water. I get back to playing as Dante and now I have to compare him to Nero. Dante has so much more and he can do so much more in comparison. So when I go back to playing as Nero, well, it's just not that much fun anymore. Dante on the other hand is way better than I remember. His arsenal is smaller and I wouldn't say the weapons are as crazy, but Pandora really makes up for it. Like like really. Look look at look at this. Look at what they gave Dante. <laughs> I can't believe it. In all seriousness though, I don't remember enjoying anything about 4 at all. I don't remember enjoying any of Dante's weapons. I couldn't even remember what they really were. I remember the whole game feeling kind of bad. But when I got to Dante and he felt like Dante in 3, if not better, it really was a sigh of relief. I was starting to get annoyed with Nero and the game was really starting to feel like a drag to get through. Styles still remain and his gameplay is still mostly there. It's easily the best feeling Dante, just not my favorite. 3 does keep that title for now, as 4 just didn't do it all for me in the gameplay department. It still felt great, don't get me wrong, it just kind of felt like an upgraded 3. But 3 just has so much more in it, so I kind of just was left wanting to go back to playing 3. As for the negatives 4 brings to the table, well, there's a lot. Instead of going in depth with them, I'm just going to spam them out. The game is unfinished. Oh, that that's just one. Yeah, I, f I, I feel like that accurately sums it all up. If I had to pick an issue besides the obvious, it would probably be replayability. Other than mastering mechanics, which I'm not too interested in, I just didn't want to play any more of the base game. But that's where the special edition comes in. 
The special edition features, more specifically three new characters, actually make the game feel much more replayable. While I'm doing all the playthroughs on my own time, I feel like it was appropriate to mention because Virgil is always fun, and you can finally play as the girls. Nero is only fun for so long and I didn't want to stick to Dante. So having three additional options, each very different, improves my biggest issue with the game a lot. You know, finishing the main story, I decided let's try them out. They're here, I'm gonna try them. And I actually found myself wanting to do a playthrough as Lady and Trish and Virgil, and I'm, I'm going to because I'll have some time after this video. It's gonna be fun and I'm looking forward to it. DMC4 isn't terrible at all. I think it's beautifully visually and has such a great soundtrack, but where it fails, it fails really hard. The gameplay is pretty good, and while I wouldn't say it's anything groundbreaking, it doesn't bring anything too terribly new, I still think I had way more fun here than some of the other games. I'm gonna sit on a score of 70 for this one, and I really do think that's fair. Now that was 4, kind of a quick little rush through, a little quicker than some of the others, but I'm just really excited to get to 5. Let's, let's move on, I can get to what I've been waiting for. Let's go to Devil May Cry 5. Well, 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 we're finally here So the most recent game, Devil May Cry 5. Funny enough, the first time I originally played this game, I stopped on exactly Mission 5. I don't, I don't know. But when drawing up this whole idea to replay every game, this was a game I was the most excited to get back on. And along with 3, this is the only game I've heard nothing but positivity about. So when I finished 4? Same night I hopped on 5. As for a little bit of history, this game came out during a serious drought. After the reboot, people feared that there's probably never going to be another mainline DMC game ever again. The reboot had an absolutely terrible fan response as well, everybody knows, and there was nothing but years of silence after its release. But out of nowhere, rumors started to spring up of a brand new title. Well, and the voice actors might have let it slip. You know, I think it's great how it happened because now they're gonna bring us back. You can say that, right? No. <laughs> yup. But with that, people were left to wonder, is this the end of Dante and his crew or could we possibly see them come back one day? Well, no one was ready for the storm that was approaching. I don't even know why I say Storm, well, you know why. But this game's reveal was loved and met with nothing but hype. And when March 2019 rolled around, it was time for the return of DMC. I don't need to say much more. If you're a DMC fan, and I'm guessing you are if you've made it this far, this game was obviously loved and is still loved. Moving on to the actual game, I absolutely loved it. I feel like I've said that about every game. Well, I know I didn't say it about two. But this really did become my favorite experience. It's the perfect way to end this run of every DMC game. Not only did it become my favorite out of the six, it easily became a favorite game of mine as a whole. I do want to say I'm going to speak about this game a bit differently. I really want to dive into each character and kind of explain their role throughout the story and how they play in like sections instead of kind of just talking about the game as a whole. So I'm going to go a bit more in depth with my retelling of the story. Yeah. Starting in what seems to be the underworld but is actually Redgrave City, we return to playing as Nero, accompanied by the mysterious V, Dante, and his female companions they confront Yurizen, a demon V hired Dante to take out. After literally an unbeatable battle, they are all annihilated. So V retreats, bringing Nero alongside him and they plan to regroup in exactly one month. Off to a crazy start with so much to explain, Nero had his arm torn off by a mysterious demon. That's why he has one arm now. He now runs an on wheels devil may cry business with Nico, a mechanic, 
And now one month later, he arrives back to Redgrave with his brand new Devil Breakers made by Nico. As he meets up with V, they plan to climb the Clive off the big tree thing. So they split up. Nero finds Lady and V tracks a demon that mentions the Sword of Sparta and seems to have Trish trapped inside of him. As Nero climbs back up to Yurizen, eager to make up for his defeat the first time, V follows traces of the Sparta. Nero now face to face with Yurizen manages to scratch him and well Yurizen's pissed off he basically one shots Nero. But before Nero passes out, he's saved by a mysterious demon. Cutting back to V, he's successfully found the Sparta and Dante alongside it. What does V do with this amazing find? Well, he tries to strike Dante using the sword. But of course Dante wakes up, recalling the events from before he was tossed out of the Clyphoth. Now on route to Yurizen, Dante is able to free Trish and he leaves her with V. As Dante rushes away, V reveals to Trish that him and Yurizen are the same. And which we, we know who Yurizen slash V is, I'm, I'm not gonna be all mysterious bro. A weakened Virgil stole Yamato from Nero, using its real power to split humanity and demon on himself. What resulted from this hope for stronger power was V, Virgil's human side, and Yurizen, Virgil's demon form. V is weakening by the moment, slowly crumbling, and his ultimate goal is to recombine with Yurizen, his other half. Meanwhile, Dante returns to his childhood home, the site where Virgil split himself. Continuing with that idea, he thinks about what Yamato was used for, and the rebellion. Realizing its effect must be the opposite, and he just impales himself. Of course, because it's Dante, it works, the sword combines with him, Unlocking the Sin Devil Trigger. Now we travel back to the cliffhanger from before. That demon that saved Nero? Well, it was obviously Dante, now in Sin Devil Trigger form. As Dante begins to fight Yurizen, the Clyphal tree completes, and Yurizen vanishes in an instant to the top of the tree. The group all reunite and begin to climb to the top, and while it's a long climb, the details aren't that important right now. What matters is that Dante reaches the top first, ready to have his final showdown with Yurizen. Yurizen manages to eat the Clyphoth fruit, but even with the huge power-up, Dante is still able to quickly and easily strike him down. Ready to finish the job, V makes it to the top just in time and is quick to recombine with Yurizen. Human and demon halves combined, we finally lay our eyes on Virgil. Dante, dead set on killing his brother again, begins to walk away. But Nero is angered, wanting to be included in this fight, angry because he feels powerless. And that's when Dante reveals something obvious. Virgil is Nero's father. He's your father! What? Now rushing to the roof of the Clyphoth, he encounters V's familiars. Virgil has no use for them anymore, after all they're just his nightmares, nightmares of his time as Nilo Angelo. Dante gives them a proper send off as they're just crumbling the same way V did. Finally at the roof, Dante locks eyes with Virgil and of course they duel. In a duel that is perfectly planned to be reminiscent of all of the duels in 3, it seems to be a stalemate, neither of them can push past the other. As it seems the fight is never going to end, they charge at one another, but this time it's stopped. Stopped by this brand new mysterious devil. We then cut back to Nero. Angered and confused at what Dante told him, he rushes out of the van. With emotions swelling, he finds a phone, and once he finds that phone, he doesn't do anything reckless. He calls the one person who knows all. Kyrie. This is my 
favorite cutscene in DMC5, and probably my favorite cutscene in all of the games. Like, the feelings here, especially with Nero being my favorite, oh, it's so good. I couldn't protect Kratos. myself for not having enough strength but this time is different i swear i'm not letting you die All that's left is a show of power. Nero beats down Virgil, leaving all three of them tired of this senseless fighting. Now that it seems like everyone's learned something important, Dante entrusts the human world to Nero, revealing he has plans to go spend time in the underworld with Virgil, them two now seemingly gotten over their issues. With that time passes, the Clyphal tree crumbles, Nero heads back to Kyrie with Nico. Virgil and Dante are just being brothers again, and Trish and Lady seem to be keeping Dante's shop alive. And the credits roll. There is a prequel manga to 5 called Visions of V, and it's beautifully illustrated. It follows V from the moment of his birth and through the events of 5. I wouldn't bring up any other media other than the game, but it's almost essential to get everything out of the story. I read it right after I finished 5, and it just it made every scene so much more impactful. We see the story from all sorts of point of views, but we never really see it through V's eyes, and knowing the full context to every scene just really makes the story feel so much more complete. We have that missing point of view, and it just really adds, it really makes this story feel the most complete out of everything we've seen so far. 3's story in comparison is amazing still, and I love everything 3 brings, its features, themes, and it's still amazing. But I think 5 just pushes it further. The themes of family are still expressed strong, as they have been in most of the other games. The way the story is written, it almost seems like everything was written around the Virgil reveal and the Nero devil trigger, and everything just ends up contributing and building to just these two key moments. Two moments that add so much for that huge theme and idea. The story is just amazing. I love the characters, I love the theme, I, I love everything it brought to the table. This story succeeded in having my heart absolutely panic, and at the same time shake with excitement. And if you ask me, that that's all a game's gotta do to like really say like, I had an impact on you, like, I made you feel that way, I'm worth something, you know? But let's start with the characters, let's, now for the characters, whatever. I'm gonna start with Nero, who could have thought, he's my favorite. Back with the new and improved shiny look, but without his devil arm, Nero is very different from 4, but he still feels similar. I love him in this game, way more than 4, and his whole arc to go along with his gameplay is just great. Nero has always wanted the power to protect his loved ones, and when Yurizen beats him without a thought, without even lifting a finger, and Dante has to rub it in, he feels inferior. He no longer has enough strength to protect anyone, and worse, he's lost his arm. In Visions of V, even V had to play off this like power complex to get Nero to come help. But Nico comes to the rescue, building him the brand new Devil Breakers and bringing him back the same strength he lost, if not more. Speaking of Nico, she's my favorite new character in this game. Her and Nero's brother-sister type of relationship feels so genuine, and when they have their moments, it feels like real people talking, as if I was talking with my friends, joking about some stupid things. It just... it feels real. She's the perfect contrast to Nero. She's loud, intense, and crude. All complete opposites of Nero. He himself being quiet, dramatic, and even, you could say, shy. 
And while it seems like they would never be friends, she's the perfect character to bring more out of him and create some of these stupid funny moments. Nico really cares though under all that silliness, you know? Being worried when she nearly runs him over and creating in the new Devil Breakers all the time. The Devil Breakers themselves are interesting. In concept, you would think taking away Nero's Devil Trigger, his Snatch, everything he has, would ruin him. But it's the complete opposite. While I do miss grabbing a huge enemy and swinging them around an arena, I do prefer the Breakers. You can go from riding a rocket, to slowing down time, to this thing. Which I did not spend money on, I was not gonna spend money on it, but bro, it's insane! My point is, the variety. Every playable character is vastly different in this game, and considering you could play as four characters, I feel like they really wanted to make Nero stand out in his way. No more calling him like a rip-off Dante, which is kind of how he felt in 4. He has these crazy arms with stupid abilities that you get in random order. It's something only he has, and it just makes his gameplay feel unique in comparison to the others. But I can't mention gameplay without talking about the gameplay in general. Stuff like the combos and the normal mechanics feel great. You know, this applies to every character as well as the style system. It's, it's always fun. Although in this game, they made it even better. Like, they perfected it. And I would say the style system has really been perfected due to one feature. The soundtracks. Higher combo, character's special song gets louder. How can it go wrong? The whole time playing, every single time you get on a high combo, the music starts blaring. The rush hits and it feels like you're playing in slow motion. It's such an insanely good feeling to have in a combat game, in a fighting game, or in like, or in a game like this where it's just hack and slash. I feel like I could play this game literally forever. Bringing it back to Nero though, his gameplay gets even better when he finishes his character arc. All he wants to do is protect family and now his uncle, which he didn't know was his uncle, is trying to kill his dad that he didn't know he had. Yeah. On the verge of a breakdown, he calls Kyrie and god I gotta love that his first reaction to this news is calling her. It's perfect, I love them. Kyrie reinforces what he needs to hear, and it's simple, stop them! So Nero finds the power from deep within and he awakens his devil trigger. Finally gaining the power to protect his family, he gets the twins to realize it's all good. Don't need to kill each other anymore, and at the end, Nero is strong enough to protect the whole world alone. He's left just to that. Nero's arc through this game is perfect, my favorite character finally having a complete story arc that wasn't for. The ending also really made me feel like his character was complete. The torch had been passed, and they can go anywhere they want now, and if it's not with Nero, I'll still be happy with it. But let's get back to that devil trigger. It's so good. The moment Nero popped in, I was like screaming. I was, I was loud. I was like, that has to be Nero, right? Like, it's gotta be him. But besides it being an amazing moment for the game, and as a fan of Nero, it's seriously really fun in the game too. Being able to use his original abilities from 4 while having the new breakers at the same time just breathes so much life into his character. And while I really don't want to ramble on because I feel like I've been talking about Nero for the last 10 minutes, it just it makes him even more fun to play. So just trust me and go play some Nero. And while Nero is super awesome, V is kind of in the middle. I don't hate V's character at all, it's quite the opposite, it's just his gameplay. Everyone who's played DMC5 knows all of the issues I'm thinking of. I could literally order DoorDash, wait 45 minutes for my food, eat it, and clean up, all while butt mashing, and like, I'd still be in the middle of a mission as V. I'm not gonna really sit here and say much more than that because I I don't even need to watch any other DMC5 videos to know everybody says the same things I would say. But the one thing I do want to highlight about his gameplay is that it really does fit into his character. And while I bet everybody else notices this, it's literally a surface point, it's just, it's just really cool. V's gameplay represents his weaknesses. He's not meant to be fun because... He's not meant to be the best feeling character or like the coolest character, well, because he's V. 
And while I could probably make an hour-long video on V and how much I love the idea of his character in the game, manga, I'm, I'm not going to. Keeping it short, V is just weak. He's crumbling, so he fights like someone who's that uses others he uses his familiars to get the edge on enemies and he has to drag himself to finish them himself it's really simple it represents how weak he is it does go a lot deeper especially in the manga explaining like what the familiars really are in more depth and how they affect v i said i'm not gonna get into that because i don't want to make this super long in like an analysis video so <laughs> basically what i loved most about v was his lore that's basically what i'm saying in all honesty, if Nero wasn't so cool, V would probably end up being my favorite from this game. Well, because you can tell I want to talk about it. The, the lore is, I'm a huge sucker for it. I'm a huge sucker for lore in video games. And V brings it all to the table. His character is just, it's perfect for someone who likes to enjoy media like me. Dante, on the other hand, has absolutely no issues. While DMC4 Dante was the best he's ever fell, and DMC3 had the coolest arsenal, each game having their own little issues, DMC5 pushed the best from both to the max. Dante's gameplay honestly feels pretty flawless. It feels really smooth, and even though his overall arsenal is smaller, each weapon just meshes so well together. Oh, but let's not forget his new and improved Devil Sword Dante form, now with Sin Devil Trigger of course, which is like, really strong. <laughs> The normal hack and slash sword is still the same, but now you can just mash the style button and the devil swords do their own thing. It's it's really good. I'm basically trying to say it feels really good to play as Dante in this game. Featuring a smaller arsenal in comparison to 3, the upgrade is that you can have all of them equipped at once and you can change them however you want. The 4 ranged weapons are pretty normal for Dante, with the exception of Dr. Faust, which... I didn't even try and use this weapon, it uses red orbs and I was trying to save them my whole playthrough, so kinda counterproductive. The melee weapons on the other hand are all really really good. Of course we already talked about Devil Sword Dante, but weapons like Balrog, which was probably my favorite other weapon, is just really cool. I like the idea of splitting the gauntlets and putting them into one weapon. You know, you know, being able to switch between the kicking mode or the punching mode, well, it's called blow mode in this game, which... Yep, good job, DMC. Um, it just, it just, <laughs> it just makes this weapon really fun. I lost my train of thought. Dante having his own styles and stuff is still here and it feels even better. Royal Guard got this really cool upgrade that made it so that it feels usable to someone who's not a god at DMC like me. I had fun using it against the Virgil fight and I'm still trying on my own time to master it. And even the other ones are just, they've gotten basic upgrades, they've gotten more moves, they all just feel better to use. Everything just feels amazing. Mechanically and gameplay wise, this really is Dante's game. You can tell the developers obviously had a sweet spot for Dante and they, they put a lot of extra time into making him feel great. They really wanted to perfect his moveset this time around and I would say they succeeded. Every issue that I would say he had from the other games feels ironed out and he's still really cool so I'd say this, this is the perfect Dante. And I'm doing it for every character, so we gotta talk about his character arc. Dante probably has the most basic character arc in this game, and that's okay. It's Dante. Like, I feel like he doesn't need to be, like, super deep in every game. He just needs to be cool. The goal in this game was to set up Nero, not really to drive Dante's character to a special new place. The biggest thing is that he really seems like his normal self most of the time. He just gets excited when he hears about his brother. He gets like this rush, like he's been craving this feeling. And well, when Virgil comes back, he has to fight him. He feels like they need to have their old duel to the death. He really wants things to go back to how they were. And when it seems like Nero's able to do that for him, he takes the opportunity. They dive straight into hell and go back to being brothers. I absolutely love Dante in this game. Playing as him, all of his moments, not as much as Nero. I, I have to say this, I'm a Nero fan, but he's, he's so good. But of course, we can't talk about Dante without talking about his twin, Virgil. The big part of this game, the big reveal, and while he appears in only like 20 minutes of the game, he captured everybody's hearts. 
And, well, I get it. Virgil steals the show in an instant. He's... He's really cool. He, he really is. <laughs> he appears and then you fight him. Not once, but twice as two characters. And both fights are amazing. You have to perfectly match him in skill. And when you do, it pushes this fight to another level. Whether it's doing perfect royal guard counters, like I said before, or just grappling him as Nero, he feels like a real boss. One that, you know, I can never really become stronger than, but I can hope to match him and just... Oh, it's so good. Enough about his boss fight though. Virgil's story in this game is simple, and it kind of falls into the same category as V, because, well, Virgil is V. I could talk about him forever, but we know there's a million videos out there talking about Virgil, so I'm not going to be the one to make another one. So, so let's just move on to his gameplay. Of course I find his gameplay fun, and I do think it can be quite easy to get high combos as him, but... Like, as far as doing all the advanced crazy stuff like I see in all these combo videos, I just, I can't get anywhere near it. And I feel like, in comparison to Nero or Dante, where like, you don't have to be that crazy for it to feel that good, I don't know. It, it's just, Virgil has never felt the same to me. Virgil does probably have the best soundtrack to go along with the style system though in this game, so... He is really satisfying to play in this game, even if, like, I do feel like I suck. And even though Virgil's a character I have the least to say on, he is the reason this game happened. His story is what sold me. Him and V's story is what got me, and as much as I love Nero, he is the main point to this game. He helps the story feel so complete. The story itself feels perfect, it spans over a few months but with so many point of views and so many character arcs and it does so many things at once, but it's not confusing. To me, it just feels like a movie. DMC5 just feels like it's a playable interactive movie and god, I, f I really fell in love with it. And even though I did fall in love with it, there are still issues. Every video game has issues, even the best rated ones. In Devil May Cry 5's case, I feel like there's not too many and that's why I'm only going to list one. There's like, no use of tons of the characters, more specifically this game's whole female cast. With the exception of Nico, most of them have little to no screen time. Lady and Trish really ever only show up in the background, with the exception of them being saved by the main characters. Kyrie, which is a big motivator for Nero, only shows up on the phone, you only ever hear her voice. And while I understand because she's never been a fighter, I just, I w I'm a little upset. As a Nero fan, I would have liked to see her after DMC4. Trish and Lady, on the other hand, do have a reason to fight. We do have a reason to see them in combat. And I wish I could have seen them fight or even play as them. That's probably asking for too much, but they're so badass and they look so good in their new outfits and look. And I wish I could have played them. That's the only nitpick I'm really going to say. I don't want to be annoying about it and list out all the little small tiny things. Because at the end of the day, they're not that bad. They, they annoy me for two seconds in game and then it's just I move on. So... I guess that's DMC5. Should I say I loved it again? Because I know I've said I loved it, it's great, whatever, a lot. Well, can you guess the score? It's it's a 100, it's easily. Easily a 100. A perfect game in every way, in my books at least. And even as I write this video, I am still playing it. This game just really spoke to me. Not a single game has made me feel like this since I played Persona 5 about a year ago. Now I just gotta hope that my review did this game some justice. And the show's over. We're finally at the end. I've checked out every single Devil May Cry game, even some of the worst ones, like the reboot and 2. So I guess we gotta answer that one question. Is DMC still boring to me? You know the answer to this. Yes, of course. No, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, of course it's not boring. I spent three whole months working on this video and I honestly enjoyed most of the process, with the playing of the games being most of that. Of course, not every moment was great and some of the games really did feel like duds to me, but I'm leaving with a way better opinion on the series. 
I can't even begin to think about what made me rush through and disregard everything in this series years ago. I'm really happy I got the chance to come back and like deliver this letter to this franchise. One that I'm actually really into now. I understand all the interest in this series despite its numerous low points. I understand why my opinion was probably wrong. And finally, I do finally understand the love. The best part about this Devil May Cry marathon was probably playing them back to back to back, and with each new installment, it felt like I was evolving with the characters. As technology, graphics, gameplay, etc. all got better, it just, it was such a good time. Starting with the fun Dante and the old feeling DMC1, all the way to the brand new Nero, V, Dante, and Virgil in DMC5. It's such a journey, one that I encourage every single person to try. Go replay them all, back to back to back, or if you haven't played it, first of all, why are you here? But just, just go play DMC. I'm not going to stretch this out any longer, that's been me and DMC. It really has been fun, a ton of fun. And I thank you for joining me if you're this far into the video. I'll see everyone next time.